Hello, everybody. Woo! Hello! Welcome! Yay! All right, welcome to the uh, July July version of uh, the Drupal NYC uh, meetup. Uh, glad to see everybody here. A um, couple things that we're going to go over before we get started. First of all, my name is Alex Ross. For those of you who don't know me, I will be your MC this evening, um, and uh, and we're gonna we're gonna get going. There's yes. If you already know me, then I'm, I, that's a fair question, and I don't have a witty response. I didn't think of that one. That's good, though. Uh, I'll think of that one next time. Um, we do have Wi-Fi here. The information is at the bottom of all the slides. So that's good. Some housekeeping. Please mute all your devices so they do not jingle and jangle during our fantastic presentations later today. Um, if you're going to be asking a question, uh, we'll be going around uh, uh, with the mic so that everyone can hear you. It also helps because we record these and put them up on the interwebs um, so that uh, the recordings have all of the audio. Um, there are restrooms. We have those too. There's, uh, I think that's the men's room back there and the women's room is, is back there. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, I was asked to remind everybody uh, that now that this is kind of becoming more our permanent home for this meetup, Please do not arrive at the meetup prior to the 6 p.m. arrival time um, because we don't want to get uh, our, our, our host people in trouble. So please arrive at 6 o'clock. Um, there's a nice plaza outside. You can go like look at tourists if you get here early or something like that. I'm sure that the naked cowboy will be around. But find something else to do until 6 and then you can come on in. Okay. Uh, so that's housekeeping. Wink. All right. I was told to wink over there uh, when I want to change the slide. Uh, agenda announcements. We're doing those now, and uh, and and then we're going to move on to our presentations. We'll have a few closing remarks, and then our after party um, has uh, reverted back to our after party location of old, the House of Brews on 51st Street. It's right down the street. Uh, so please join uh, join your fellow Drupal NYC folks afterwards for some uh, beverages and conversation and you know socializing. Okay. So here we go. We have uh, three talks today. Uh, Dominic, where's Dominic? Dominic, there he is in the back. Dominic, uh, he's going to be talking about content systems architecture um, and uh, and how to approach that in a decoupled world. Uh, we have uh, Father Sean Duncan is right over there. Sean, he's going to be talking about extending dependency injected core classes. Um, uh, that's really hard to say, actually. Yeah. Um, it's easier to do. It's harder to say, but we're going to find out about that from Sean. Uh, and then Jim and Jeremy, where's Jim? Where Jim and Jeremy? Jim and or Jeremy? These gentlemen right here, uh, stage left. Uh, they're going to be talking about Drupal uh, on Kubernetes. Excellent. So we have three great talks coming up, and uh, we'll get to those in in just a minute. Let's move on to the next slide. Here we go. Uh, your organizers. So these are your organizers for Drupal NYC. Many of them are in the room. If you're an organizer, wave your hand just for a second. Wave. We got JD. We have Holing. We, uh, we, we uh, encourage you to come up and talk with the organizers. If you have suggestions, if you have uh, ideas, if you want to get involved more in Drupal NYC, please come talk to us. Um, or come contact some of these fine folks who aren't uh, able to make it today. All right. What's next? Click. It worked. Um, thank you very much to our sponsor, uh, MongoDB. Woo! Yay! Um, they they have been uh, very they have been very generous in allowing us to use their their space here and and buying us food. And so we are very appreciative of that. Click. Click is broken. Oh, they didn't buy the food because the food was sponsored by Pantheon. Nailed it. All right. Thank you, Pantheon for sponsoring our food. Um, fabulous. Uh, yeah, go Pantheon. Drupal hosting, excellent. Click. All right, uh, connect with us. We are on the Twitters, we are on Slack. Um, we are on other, other forms of, of uh, social media and, and connectivity as well. These are probably the two easiest ways to get a hold of anybody from Drupal NYC. Uh, if you want to join our Slack channel, I highly recommend you do so. Go to drupal.nyc slash Slack, um, and you can join us there. Uh, yeah, please do that. Click. Here we go. Photos and hashtags. If you do take any photos, please use the hashtag Drupal NYC. Um, and uh, that way we can make all of your uh, friends and neighbors and followers jealous that they were not here. Okay. Click. Here we go. Uh, the Drupal Association. Um, for those of you who are, are new um, or are unfamiliar with the Drupal Association, the Drupal Association is um, a, the non-for-profit organization that 
kind of uh, uh, helps keep the Drupal community and the Drupal project healthy and active. They do a lot of work around Drupal.org, which frankly, the project wouldn't be able to, to sustain itself without Drupal.org and all the tools um, and communication kind of platform that that provides. Um, they do a lot of work around DrupalCon um, in North, both North America, in Europe. They've done a few others around the world. Um, and uh, it's a non-for-profit. They're supported by members. Um, you know, uh, so please uh, consider joining as an individual member, or they also have the opportunity for like an organization to join and help support the Drupal community. If you are making your living, as many of us are, um, you know, because Drupal is a, is a great piece of software um, and works really well for, for you and for what you're doing, then really, you know, consider giving a little bit back to the Drupal community by becoming an, a Drupal Association member. You can find out more by Googling Drupal Association, because I always forget the link, but it's like association, Drupal.org slash association, something like that. All right, next. Here we go, upcoming events. There are several. Um, decoupled Dev Days. Uh, so this is, um, oh, they, they renamed it Decoupled Days. Is that true? Yeah, all right. It's been renamed, rebranded. Um, but they, this is a um, conference that really focuses on um, decoupling kind of the back end CMS portion of Drupal from the front end, like presentation layer or other uses of the data that's in Drupal. Um, they do a lot of really great presentations. Uh, it's coming up in, in just about a week and a half. Um, do a quick Google and, and, and I highly recommend uh, uh, that particular conference. Um, building faster PHP apps in NYC. Um, this is more of a PHP, it's not Drupal specific, but certainly Drupal uses a little bit of PHP, so it certainly applies. Um, that's coming up in a couple weeks, also here in New York, um, down in Bethesda, uh, which is right outside of Washington, D.C., is uh, Drupal GovCon coming up. So get your uh, Amtrak tickets ready. That's in a couple weeks. Drupal Camp Colorado in Denver, first week of August. Midwest Drupal Summit, which is in, oh, it's in Ann Arbor. I don't think I've ever done it in Ann Arbor. Usually it's in Chicago, isn't it? Am I making that up? Anyway, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, also coming up uh, right at the beginning of August. Um, Drupal Camp LA later in August. So, you know, you have a little time to still get a decent fare on the flight. Um, and then you can always go to uh, DrupalCal and groups.drupal.org slash events to find out about other events that we're, we're not listing. But there are quite a few camps going on. Um, if you've never been to, yes, sir, you in the, in the back. Um, will there be t-shirts at the decoupled days? I am not sure. I do know that at the first one there were. And second one, I, I, so I suspect there will be. Oh, we have, this gentleman here feels like they've asked the t-shirt size when you register. I don't recall that, but I may be wrong. Yeah, they did. Okay, so that would be strange for them to ask for t-shirt sizes. And you get there and they're like, and here's your hat. Okay. All right. Uh, next, click. Here we go. Um, interested in speaking, we're always looking for good, uh, engaging speakers with topics that they uh, feel passionate about. If you have a topic you feel passionate about, please, um, you know, come talk to us about the possibility of speaking at one of our future events. Um, it doesn't have to be, uh, uh, you know, it could be anything from a five minute, like quick uh, lightning talk. Hey, I learned this new thing and I just wanted to share it with everybody uh, all the way through like a long involved, you know, I'm going to take you through a process from beginning to end and really go, you know, a little bit more in detail um, from, you know, uh, um, uh, for like a kind of a full like 30 or 40 minute type thing. Um, so please uh, come find one of the uh, organizers and let us know if you're interested in speaking or if there's like a particular topic that you've been just dying to hear about, um, come tell us that and we'll try and, you know, see if we can't do a, a matchmaking thing and, and find somebody who, um, who is able to speak to that topic and, and make it happen. All right. Uh, you can also go to jubile.nyc slash suggest. All right. Um, Who's hiring? Raise your hand if you are hiring. Oh, we got one. We got one. But he seems really reluctant about saying he's hiring. So I'm going to, so you so, said, okay, give us, give us two sentences. So I work for Pantheon. We are hiring on the, this is Pantheon's a platform that supports Drupal from the infrastructure layer. So we're always looking for Drupalistas, Drupalistos, uh, but we're also hiring on support, sales. Yeah. Pantheon, always hiring. Okay, um, there we go. Excellent. That's my that's that's my six and a half year old when he was four. I didn't need to update that picture or come up with a new one. Yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll we'll update it. Okay, because um, he was hiring at the time, but he's not hiring anymore. Um, all right, click. Here we go. What do we got next? Um, oh, an update. Sean, do you want to take this, or should you want me to take this? 
All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna bring Sean up. Sean is the um, is the what is, what is the director chairperson chair of uh, of Drupal NYC, which is our newly formed uh, nonprofit. So here we go, Sean. And Alex is vice chair. Don't let him fool you. <laughs> Deputy chair. Sorry. Uh, so uh, JD suggested we give an update on where we are with our nonprofit corporation, and we're basically done. Um, we're legal. We're nonprofit approved by the IRS. Uh, we have a bank account. Uh, I have a couple more housekeeping things to do in the accounting department. Holing and I are working sort of once a week getting together on a virtual meeting. Uh, we've got a QuickBooks Online account um, so we can keep the books, we've got, but we have to figure out how to issue invoices um, so to our sponsors. And um, we have to set up a, a process for getting reimbursed and dealing with expenses and some of that sort of housekeeping stuff. But basically we're done. Um, we did hit a roadblock, which is for, I don't know what, like five years or so, we've had this domain lent to us. Um, it says on the bottom of all of our slides that we're at drupal.nyc because there's a geographic specific domain for New York City. Um, and uh, so that domain is registered by someone else. And, and um, so we have attempted to, to have a conversation with that person about making a donation. Um, uh, a tax deductible do donation uh, because we're a nonprofit uh, for the to give us that domain um, and that has not borne fruit. Um, now domains that are top level domains that start that are just the word Drupal all by themselves, they're actually under the the uh, the legal licensure authority of our benevolent dictator for life himself, uh, Dries personally. Um, so we've just handed it back over to Dries's office um, to do with what they will. And we're in the process of migrating all of our web services to drupalnyc.org because that was 10 bucks. So um, the, at some point in the next month or so, you'll probably see our website move and we'll um, I don't think we even control the DNS for, for that thing. So that we're probably the best we'll be able to do is leave behind a page that says, we're not here, we're over there. We'll see. Um, yeah, we'll figure something out. Um, uh, it's a it's a GitHub repository that's being it's being served by GitHub, and so you know if there's an Apache server, I know what to do, but I don't know what to do with that. But maybe somebody else will. So that's where we are. Um, uh, it's been a lot of work from a lot of people. Um, uh, we also have with us tonight uh, members of the board of directors. Um, Scott Walpo is our secretary. And Chris, where's Chris? Chris is the director. And uh, Garvida is also uh, a director. And uh, there are five of us. So that's it. Yeah. And Holing's our treasurer. Yes, sir. That's a really great question. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, Ho Holing is over there in a purple t shirt. Um, she's our treasurer. She'll be happy to take your check. Um, yes, absolutely. Yes. We're, we're, we're in the process of developing a uh, supporting member program. Uh, we're not a membership corporation in the sense that we don't have people who like become a member and then get governance rights in the, in the corporation, but like kind of like WNYC, we'd kind of like to have supporting members as a way of, of, of fundraising. So we're in the process of building that. Um, we also have board members who are in the process of recruiting uh, a lead so we can get Drupal, NYC, Drupal Camp NYC back up off because we, we had to have this corporation in order to do all the contracts for that. Um, if that's a passion of yours, Camp, um, talk to one of the, the officers that I named. I think that's about it. Thank you very much. All right, Father Sean, ladies and gentlemen. Woo! Um, yeah, so Drupal NYC, we're a real live nonprofit. All right. Um, okay, so introductions. Take, take a couple minutes and introduce yourself to someone who you have not introduced yourself to before at one of these camps. If you're new, that could be anyone. If you're here, if you've been here before, that could be someone you have not introduced yourself to. So take a couple minutes. I will find a very inopportune time to cut you off and, uh, and we'll continue. There we go. How are you? How's it going? Joe. 
Yo, nice to meet you. Thank you. Alex, right? It's true. And you're the man. This is I, your. This is well. I get to talk a lot because <laughs> I, I I I don't mind speaking in front of a large crowd. So. <laughs> I do what I can. Uh, I, listen, I listen to a lot of stand up. Who's your favorite? Uh, George Carlin. I was going to say George, George Carlin. George Carlin. My, and then hands down. You said. Richard Carlin, too. Bruce yeah. Carlin. Bruce. What are the chances of getting that domain if you approach him as a non group of person? Um, he, he would be happy to give us the domain. He would like $20,000 in unmarked bills. <laughs> That's where we're at. Yeah. yeah. So, um, man. Is it somebody normally of the group? group? No, it's a guy. He's got a he's got like a domain holding company and just buys shit. I don't know what the difference is, but what, what is the summit for? It's, it's for summoning. There's code sprints. There's porting lines. Yeah, but that would be at a camp. Looks a lot too. like a camp. Yeah, it does. It? Yes, yeah, exactly. It could be like like nice camp versus. Uh, so basically, Ann Arbor decided to do their own thing. Uh, uh, this is what you're instructed to do. What yeah. do you? Uh, uh, what's, your, what's your story? What's your Drupal story? Yeah, I don't have one. Oh, so I un yeah. So I just finished uh, coding boot camp. Okay. For web development. Yep. Um, I don't have any experience with Drupal other than okay. reading about it online. All right. And I just wanted to no, see the this talk. Is, this is you a know? great. I mean, I'm trying to meet people in the industry, and I just wait here like. Uh, but no, 
Mighty Pain. They're coming to the some of the talks today are a little bit more advanced. Not all of them. Some of them are but anyway, it's a really good group. And stop. All right. Hopefully, if my plan went exactly, if everything went exactly as planned, you were right in the middle of a fantastic conversation that you will like to continue at uh, a House of Brews after we're done, and that's why, and so everyone will come and continue that conversation. All right, um, awesome, so here we go, click, there we go. All right, so, so where's Dominic at? Dominic, come on up. Um, if you're not on Zoom already, please go on Zoom and talk to Chris. Um, he's Zooming, all right, so while Dominic's on his way up, um, we're going to, I, I, was, I, was, I was told that today, um, if you look out the window, you can actually see the Statue of Liberty from here. And today there was a ticker tape parade for the Women's World Cup team. Go USA, 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 equal pay, USA. Um, they, they had a ticker, ticker tape parade earlier today. And the very first ticker tape parade, apparently, unverified, allegedly, was for when the opening of the Statue of Liberty when it, when it went up there. It was on Gothamist, so it must be true, because Gothamist has never gotten anything wrong. Okay, here we go. Dominic, are you ready? much. Someone needs to stop sharing so I can start sharing apparently according to Jim. Okay. She stopped sharing. It's all you. Okay. Alright. Just talk into the camera. Alright. Thank you. All right. So there's a fairly clunky system for sharing keynotes at this point. So bear with me while I try and set that up. All right. Hi, I'm Dominic. I'm um, co-founder at Metrix Group and formerly uh, engineering manager and head of content platform at The Economist. And that's a little of what we're going to talk about today. I was actually at Drupal NYC four years ago now talking about the start of this journey. So it's really interesting and exciting to be back here four years later, a lot has happened since, finishing off where we got to. And we're gonna be talking about the content platform, which is essentially a layer of abstraction between a decoupled site and the CMS backends. And specifically what we were looking for was something that would handle multiple sources of information. So, there are various patterns that we're gonna look at today that I think are a good, good general advice for building content systems in a loosely coupled way. And by loosely coupled, I mean a system that's easy to maintain and easy to change as it evolves. We generally think of decoupled as just pulling the site off the back of Drupal. But there's actually many types of decoupling. You can, um, you can decouple platforms, you can decouple in time, you can decouple from the code base, from locations, from control of flow of the site. There are many, many things. So we're gonna have a look at some of those. And what we're gonna find is that as we start looking at systems, we need to switch from a mindset of software to a system thinking mindset. And this fabulous slide kind of illustrates a lot of those conceptual points that I'm gonna be making throughout. So it's gonna be drawing heavily on the experience at The Economist and how we built the content platform, but hopefully, with some patterns that are abstract enough so that if you're using different technologies, they still apply. So to give a little more context, I'm gonna start with a story. So once upon a time, we moved from a custom CMS to Drupal. And we did that because, well, to be honest, we were tired of solving the same problems that everyone else had already solved somewhere else. So we can do more, with less custom code, it's gotta be a good thing. So we moved to Drupal. 
and it's awesome. We can do anything. We can extend it. We can use features that we hadn't even thought about that are already available from the community. And beyond that, we can extend it in a number of other ways using custom code if we need to. And gradually, it starts to gain gravity. And the more and more features we add, the harder it becomes to justify creating any other feature outside of this one monolithic code base. If we want to have a new section of theeconomist.com, it needs login, and login is in the monolithic stack. So it doesn't really make sense for us to build it separately. We'd have to do a whole bunch of work. So it kind of becomes a vicious cycle. You add more and more and more, and at some point, you end up adding something that is absolutely business critical and cannot go down. And that exists alongside functionality or features that are a little more experimental where we want to move fast. And that creates a big tension. Maybe there's something that goes wrong. Maybe there's a bad code release, or maybe there's a site issue that's particularly hairy, or maybe it's just the scary prospect of one of those things. But what ends up happening is we add more process. We add more extensive code reviews, regression testing, end-to-end -end testing, zero downtime releases, schema changes that you can roll back without having to do a lot of work on the database. Effectively, we trade speed for stability. But not all changes are equal. And the front end team is particularly buried under this new process. They're kind of trapped between the need to have more and more interactive pages and a system that's now optimized for stability, not for moving fast. Product, find their own solution. So these are the people that are creating new sites, new products, new apps. And their solution is to create a completely separate Drupal site. Great. They can use the newest version of Drupal. They can have no process whatsoever. It's fine. It's all very beta. They don't even need a staging site. They can be heroes. They can deliver super fast. And we're assured that these things are completely separate. There's no way we're ever going to need the information that's in the app to be on the site. There's no integration required here. Until, of course, there is. So inevitably, something has to be done. But worry not, this is a one-off thing. We're just going to manually copy and paste content from one CMS to the other. And the production team's actually going to take care of this for this. And honestly, they don't mind. They're fine with this. I think it's a great idea. Thus is born the human syndication system that just will not die. The front end finds a different way to get out from underneath the monolith, and they start experimenting with front end frameworks, specifically on some of the smaller sites. So the world if is a forecasting um, product that The Economist does looking at years ahead. And you can tell this is from the original slide that I used because it's August 2015. Um, so this is actually a React site that is talking to a Drupal 7, I think, CMS on the back end, back at that time. And they got some really good results with this. So great, we're all settled. We're going to decouple. That solves all our problems. Or does it? What about the monolith? What about that huge Drupal site? Can we just add a lick of paint to it, a decoupled front end, and just forget about it? Can we just live with it? Probably not, because by now there are two newer versions of Drupal available, so we're reaching end of life. We're on borrowed time. Something has to be done. We need to break it up or upgrade it, but there's over 400 modules on this, and about half of those are custom. So this isn't really a, an upgrade. This is a complete rebuild that we're talking. So more specifically for this particular story, we need integration. So we need to bring together that content that was put into separate Drupal CMSs, and we need to bring it together to be able to create new product offerings that combine and repackage content. So that's where we're at. And because I know this is a little bit mm, complicated, and it's easy for me to just drop into the technical detail of it, this is where we are. 
we are between the websites and apps and the CMSs. We're existing in a separate space. And that's primarily what we're going to be looking at and the patterns we're going to be observing. So what did we want to do? Fundamentally, we wanted smaller blocks of code. That's inherently a good thing for engineers. They're more predictable. They're easier to work with. You can release them having a fair amount more certainty of what's going to happen when you release because you can keep it all in your head. So that's a great thing. And it's not a new thing. It's been around for, well, since the 70s, the Unix philosophy is largely based on um, modular code that can be composed to do more and more complex things. Before microservices, there was service-oriented architecture and all those kind of things. So this isn't necessarily a new concept, but definitely one that we wanted to embrace, particularly coming from a very monolithic code base. One of the principal reasons that decoupling is appealing to people is the ability to use the right tool for the job. If you have a team that's well-versed in JavaScript and they don't really want to ramp up on a whole PHP monolithic stack, then the ability to have a front end that's just written in Node is going to be an advantage for you. For us in the content platform, we wanted to use Golang to create microservices and we wanted them to run in AWS. And there was a whole bunch of tooling that got added. All kinds of AWS services, CICD pipelines. There was effectively a Cambrian explosion of new technology that came into The Economist at this point. And the team rocked it. They got on board, and they got up to speed with all these tools, and they just kept kicking forward. We also knew that we wanted the abstraction layer. We don't just want to plug a decoupled front end into Drupal directly because we have multiple sources to deal with. And anyway, that would, in a way, still be coupled. So retrospective, how did it go? Well, the abstraction was great. The layer of abstraction gave us a way forward out of a monolithic Drupal site, a way to imagine how we were going to gradually replace pieces of it. It gave a, a layer of stability, almost like scaffolding in front of that old CMS and allowed us to build new things without causing too much disruption to it. We spent a lot of time improving the separation between content and display logic. I'm sure you're familiar with the phrase, just add a field. Um, often, when we want to do something that is stylistic or controlling the display of our website, we deal in content types. So there isn't always necessarily a clean separation. So there was a, a lot of passionate conversations about whether that was a pattern we should continue within the microservices. Int. It's not. Once you do it, you can never remove them. So best to keep it clean. And the other thing that we did was to look at the, the types of information that we're getting from the bootstrap process. So sometimes we're dealing with a page in Drupal, and we're inferring from the URL what the context is. That won't work in a decoupled site, because the decoupled site is probably making a request for content ID something or other, not for a full URL. So there's no way for you to know how that content that's being requested is going to be used. So it's a little bit of an architectural shift. On what went less well, systems like these that involve multiple different parts that have to communicate with each other are inherently complex. It's more difficult to monitor, more difficult to do logging effectively across many different um, microservices. It's also hard to trace through the stack where exactly a request is going. So when things fail, and they inevitably always do, it can be hard to figure out what exactly is failing and why. That is compounded when you have multiple teams that are responsible for different parts of the stack. Just the logistics of whose problem is this when we don't know means that you have to have someone that's looking at a system level 
across teams rather than you know having the well i'm sure it's not the front end let's kick it over the wall to the back end team and the back end says no it's not us it must be the mid tier that really doesn't work so that's another thing that we found difficult and we had to learn a lot about that the last thing that i'm going to say that didn't go very well was we knew we wanted these small blocks of code we knew we wanted a microservices approach but we really didn't put a lot of thought into how they were going to talk to each other so what we end up with is requests that are coming all the way down through the chain. An app or a website is making a request to the platform and that request is being handed from one microservice to another all the way back to Drupal to get the information, translate it and pass it back. That takes time, latency alone of those multiple requests. So we cover it with caching, lots of caching, layers upon layers of caching. Our architect that came in halfway through this said, this is a cache lasagna. And it was very difficult to figure out exactly when something was going to actually expire from a cache. So not so well. So lots of change over the following few years from this initial point where we'd established this as a pattern and got an initial site up there in a, in a, decoupled, a decoupled site and a microservices layer the pattern was there, but it definitely needed refinement. And over the, the next few years, what we looked at were a number of things to fix some of those issues. And these are the patterns that I'm going to dive into in a little more detail, because I think these are really potentially transformational. So five essential patterns. And the first one is the canonical data model. So essentially, what we created was a unified format across all types. When we started originally with the microservices approach, we did, as all good agile teams do, a thin vertical slice at the time. So you can imagine we built a blog microservice, and then we built an article microservice, and then we built something to be able to put requests for blog content to the blog microservice, requests for article content to the article microservice, and so on. That was already starting to creak a little bit and not, um, not really an effective pattern. It also involved a high degree of duplication because the article and the blog content type were 90% the same, and maybe 10% different. So our format that we were exposing to the clients, to the consumers, to the decoupled website had variations in the content that meant in order to know what you have to do with this content to render it, you need to know what type of content it is. So you're passing that complexity down. Instead, with the canonical data model, everything gets mapped into one consistent format. So it's a dependable structure across not only content types, but across multiple sources. So um, some of the sources we integrate are not even Drupal. They can be things like uh, an audio file or a video file or an image and they still get mapped to that same canonical content. So it gives you a lot more um, dependability when you're interacting with the content. For us, it also gave us a, a layer in the system at which we could do integration. And we're moving capabilities at this point out of Drupal into a layer in the content platform. So, let me give an example because this is a little unclear at times. Imagine a semantic tagging service. So you want all your content to be categorized. And traditionally, you would enable a module in Drupal and that would be it. Maybe it calls an external API, something like that. What if you're doing that on multiple different sources? Those, they may not even be using the same tool. Maybe one on Drupal site is using Open Calais and another one is using, I don't know, Inform. You can tell how long it's been since I've looked at semantic tagging in Drupal. Um, so what you ideally want is for the semantic tagging to happen across all content. So you have a consistent taxonomy to refer to content. Otherwise, what you end up with is content that's come from silos that still kind of groups in that siloed shape. There's nothing to create cross use of content if you don't have something 
like semantic tagging. So we built it on top of the canonical content. So what that means is um, as the content comes into the content platform and gets translated into this baseline format, every service that we build is building on top of that. That means if later on we add another source, another Drupal type or a different type of media, all the services that we've already built will work for that new content that's being added because it's operating on the same basic structure. So it's a really powerful concept. And not only did it define the content, but it also defined the relationships between the content. So an article belongs to a print issue, for example. So our article content model had a is part relationship to a print issue. And a print issue had a has part relationship to multiple, multiple articles. And that was extended to cover not just um, different content types, but also lists. So you could have multiple connections between um, a, an article and a list and a print issue and whatever else it, wherever else it may feature. We extended that pattern one step further still to create a curation service to allow editors to say, I want to pull together a package of content across all our sources. And instead of up until that point, they'd been doing it in Drupal, so they only had access to the data that was available in that one Drupal instance. They couldn't grab information from one of the other sister sites. So by moving that into the content platform, we opened up the ability for them to create those uh, rich packages of content that combine things like videos and audio edition content and really create some more um, featureable, featureable products. But there was still another step that we needed to, we needed to go a step further. We're, we're starting at this point to break down capabilities that are in the CMS, but what we really needed was to also think about how the microservices were going to interact with each other. In the initial implementation, like I said, it was very much based on a request. A request for a piece of content comes in and all the microservice, uh, you can imagine them in one long chain, a very linear process, one calls the next, calls the next. The problem with that is if you have to add another microservice into that chain, you don't have to just create the microservice, you also have to amend the microservices that are around it so that they are aware of it. That creates a kind of brittle system that isn't that easy to change. And what we really want in a loosely coupled system is asynchronous communication. And that's typically done through messages. So we move from having a request based, a request that's driving the entire process to a split between, effectively between reads and writes in the system. So a write in this case is Drupal creating a piece of content and that would kick off an event and the event would come to the content platform and the content platform would process the content and make it available. And then at some later point, a request comes in and the content's already there. It's already pre-generated so it can be served really fast from whatever the closest layer to the client is giving you much, much better performance and much better resilience as well, because there isn't this um, connection all the way back that creates a risk of cascading failures. So implementing events was one of the most transformational things that we did. It gave us the ability to shift from these microservices to a pattern that we call workers, which are fundamentally still the same concept, still a small block of code that's doing one thing, but it is triggered based on an event coming into its queue. And it will just process those events without really having an understanding of what else is going on in the system around it. That kind of autonomy for a service is crucial because you can then amend parts of the system without any other part of the system needing to be updated. That's very, very powerful. So this all sounds pretty simple, maybe. Um, you have workers, 
you have events, you have messages and queues. These are all pretty established patterns. So, so where's the complexity gone? The complexity in this kind of system ends up going to the connections between the pieces, how to get them to talk to each other and how to deal with some of the common problems that happen like network instability causing a message to go missing. How do we cope with that? What do we do? Even with queues that sound like a relatively simple concept, we have um, control over concurrency. So how many messages will a queue um, allow to be consumed at one time? So we could have maybe 10 workers of a particular type pulling messages from that queue. Or maybe in some scenarios, and we had this with something like Apple News, you can only send one thing at a time. So in that case, we need to be able to control this worker can only run one at a time and process one message at a time versus these other workers, we want them to scale up and process hundreds at the same time. So that complexity is, again, a solved problem. When we move into the space of working with patterns that are well established, and these are all enterprise integration patterns, then we move into a space where every, there are likely solutions for this that already exist. And cloud providers also tend to align pretty strongly along with tools that support these types of enterpri enterprise integration patterns. So we can offload complexity to service providers so that effectively what we end up worrying about and maintaining is just the business logic that sits within the actual code that's going to execute. And all the complexity of how to configure one worker to listen to a certain queue or how many messages or what the timeouts are, when the queue, when the queue will decide that a message must have got lost and re-add it, how we deal with persistent failures, things like dead letter queues, those are all configuration options within something like Amazon SQS. So we have a great opportunity to park all that complexity with someone else and just worry about the pieces that we, that we need to maintain that are custom to us. So yes, uh, love or hate the term, at this point, the platform is cloud native. The next pattern is to design for change. And that's because the cloud services aren't really a static thing. There are constant um, updates and new announcements and new product offerings or new features that a product has. So the decisions that you make at the beginning may not still stack up a couple of years down the line. And we had this with, with our workers, which are the essential bit of code that's doing the work. Initially, we created them as containers, and containers had a really rich integration with SQS. So you could do all the concurrency control and dead letter queues and how long it could execute for, all those kind of things were available as configuration. We could use Golang, which is good. But over time, those capabilities started to move to other offerings like Lambda they started allowing longer execution times. They added native support for Golang. They added better concurrency controls to the point where one day as we're trying to create a new worker, and by now this is sort of a rinse and repeat process for us. We've done it so many times. Everything's a worker, everything has a queue. We just slot it in, plug it in, we're done. Someone asked the question, hey, why aren't we using Lambda for this? And we discovered that, in fact, there wasn't a reason. We could make the content platform serverless by moving our business logic from containers to Lambda functions. And it's in part because it's so well contained. The business logic code didn't have any of the kind of orchestration code that you normally have when you need a given service to know its environment and how to interact with it. If you're able to abstract the business logic and keep it clean and push all that complexity into configuration, then it becomes a lot easier to move the business logic code 
from a container to Lambda. And we found that when we did this, there was, I think, like two lines of code that needed to be changed. Yes, there's a lot of configuration around to switch Lambdas to listen to queues instead of containers, but we could move our actual business logic with, with surprising ease. And this really helps. It helps to be able to effectively leverage the capabilities of the platform in the moment. And it helps to avoid that fear of lock-in. If you can take your code and move it into a different pattern or a different implementation, and as we said, these sort of enterprise integration patterns are pretty common across different service providers, different cloud providers. You could potentially move all your code into GCP from AWS or move it into Azure. That's very, very powerful. But it's not just the code, obviously. There's still data. What do you do with your data? And my suggestion here for ensuring that data is portable is to always try and use an industry standard if it's available. Our canonical data model aligned with the schema.org types. So that gives us an externally understandable structure for our content. It also makes sure that we think about what are we calling these things and are we using words that are just meaningful to us? So in the initial microservices, we were still doing some of this. We were translating field underscore rubric underscore value to rubric and thought, yeah, that's good. We, we left all the Drupalisms behind. But when we started looking at canonical data model and schema.org, we realized, well, rubric really is a fancy word for description. So let's just call it description. So the ability to have your data in those industry standard formats makes it easier to find, maybe there's a client library that can easily interface with it because it already has a predictable structure. And we also use this in the semantic tagging service. So when we were evaluating vendors for a semantic tagging service, we looked specifically for vendors that were gonna give us data back in industry standard formats, specifically Wikidata entries, which are um, entities in a normal semantic tagging taxonomy, uh, all with their references to Wikipedia pages, which is potentially very useful for us going forward. And the other format was IPTC, uh, which is a industry standard for the publishing industry um, for categorizing news effectively. So by using those standards, if we need to swap out the semantic tagging provider, we can do so without having to do a very complicated data remapping from one standard to another. So beware of using a custom format that is proprietary to a given vendor. That's a really easy way to end up getting locked in. And if you can use industry standards, if they are available, sometimes they're not, um, it's very beneficial. So lots of change. Um, it felt at times during this process like we were re-architecting the platform every couple of months. And that brings me to the last point, which is the socio-technical side of it. And what you really are looking for is for the teams to embody the characteristics of the systems that you're trying to build. This is um, Conway's law effectively. The communication patterns of an organization will mirror the systems that they produce. So we want a system that's loosely coupled, right? It doesn't have a lot of orchestration. Another way of thinking of that is it doesn't have a lot of control. We want autonomy and we want that for our teams too. We want our teams to be able to work together as autonomous individuals that produce emergence, which is where the sum is greater than the parts. We want that for our systems, we want it for our teams. And this involved a lot of change. For me particularly, I am not a very communicative person despite standing up here talking at you at length, but I'm most, most likely to be the person in a conversation that's listening and maybe chipping in a couple of words here and there. So for the system that we were trying to build and my role in it, I really had to change that communication pattern and to build connections with the people that were either already using the platform or planning to use the platform 
and build those trust relationships and have transparency. There was a lot of that kind of thing that we had to get really good at doing as we moved into a more system focused space. Some of the things that we implemented were top down elaborations. And this is a very simple document that helps structure a, um, a conversation. So focusing us on making sure we're talking about the why first and what level of conversation should we be having and who needs to be in the room for that conversation. We can have a why conversation at a very high level that touches on um, roughly when this is needed and what would be ahead of it in a roadmap, those kind of questions. When we start getting to the how questions, that's when we really need engineers to be in the room. Because if, if I'm not the one that's actually going to build it, then I also don't want to be the one that's estimating how long it's going to take. It's not going to be me that has to stand up for that estimate. So the how conversations led us to realize that often it is really hard to keep the whole system in your head at one time. So one thing we did was collectively model. And modeling doesn't have to be very difficult. You don't have to dive right into doing UML diagrams or whatever else. A whiteboard sketching can very, very quickly crystallize um, where there are differences in, in, in understandings. And I've seen that where the engineer and the architect and the platform owner have completely different visions of how the system is working at one given time. And the model is the quickest way to do that. Sketch it on a whiteboard, take a picture of it with your phone and upload it somewhere where you share documents. With any luck, some enterprising soul will convert it into UML for you. So those are the five things that I wanted to talk about. And they are the things that really made a huge difference for us. And as I started working with other organizations, obviously I'm no longer at The Economist now, neither is any of the team that actually worked on this, funnily enough. Um, now we've all gone our separate ways, but as we start to work with more organizations and more clients, we see how these patterns can apply to anyone that's going down this journey of decoupling or creating systems that are more interactive. And that's pretty much any content system at this point. It's hard to think of a scenario, even the simplest blog, where you're not at least dealing with multiple types of content. Maybe it's videos or images or audio files or something. And you're pushing that content not just to your site, but you're also pushing it to social. So in effect, all content systems are moving towards this pattern of multi-source and multi-destination. And that's why we see initiatives like Drupal going API first or WordPress trying to tackle their body blob and breaking that down. It's hard to find a content system provider that isn't engaging in at least some form of API to allow these kind of decoupling or interactive, interacting with different parts of a system. With that said, I hope those patterns are useful. Uh, I hope they give a new um, filter to look at your systems through. Um, but bear in mind that each organization is different. Each organization has its own collection of people and processes and technologies and goals. So not all of these patterns will apply, but I hope at least they give some food for thought. And this is exactly the kind of work that we at Mentrix are engaging with, with different clients. and. Personally, I find it fascinating. So if you are staying around today, please grab me and tell me your experiences. I'd love to hear if they align with these patterns, if they strengthen these patterns, or if they're completely different. So any questions? Shoot. Test, test, all right. Mm -hmm. Hi, when you left The Economist, did you get a free lifetime subscription to The Economist? No, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, that's but terrible. Insider tip. If you visit The Economist offices on a Friday, you will find a nice stack of print editions at reception. Just saying. 
Great. Thanks for that. Another question? Over there. Yeah, I got one. I'll, I'll back up so I'm not looking right in the face. Uh, so it sounded like you had an SRE type issue when you had a number of microservices behind uh, GraphQL. And it seemed like you were wrapping a lot of uh, REST APIs and that's what how the diagram looked anyway. Do you think that, that was uh, correlated or uh, what do you think that that issue was? Um, well, interestingly, it came up um, the last time I was here when we were just starting the journey, the question um, came up as to what are we gonna do about lists? And that question, we hadn't really got there was the honest answer at that point. And it's list that created some of the um, thorniest issues for us. Because you can imagine once a week, the economist creates a new issue that has 90 articles in it and is uncached because it's just being created. So you have a single request for a print edition triggering hundreds of requests back through the system that are all concurrent at the same time. So in front, that goes to GraphQL first and then goes through an API gateway, which is essentially a sandwich of Nginx and Varnish to um, you know, do things like URL normalization as well as just the caching. And it was unclear whether the, the amount of concurrent requests were causing a problem to Varnish or whether it was further down the stack that something was timing out. But for sure, it was unstable and particularly tricky to, um, to iron out. In fact, we ended up creating multiple API gateways for different parts of the stack. There were some legacy APIs related to app development that we moved off to a completely different stack to see if that helped resolve some of the, uh, some of the issues. Push notifications were another. You send out a push notification and you get a flood of traffic through um, through those uh, caching stacks. And that was, uh, that was causing problems where AWS couldn't scale up um, load balances fast enough to deal with the load that was coming in. So those kind of issues are, are really tricky. <laughs> and they get more tricky the more parts of the system you have. Because, you know, in the old days, there's a problem with the site. It's Drupal, right? <laughs> there wasn't anything else for it to be, really. Any other questions? No. All right. Thank like you very much. <laughs> Woo! Yay! Thank you. All right. We're going to get the slides back up. So, in the meantime, I'm going to. There we go. Thank you, Dominic. All right. Uh, uh, Sean is going to, he's going to talk to us about dependency injection. Fantastic. This is Sean, everybody. Yeah. I, didn't do it. I didn't do it either. It wasn't me. <laughs> Testing. Excellent. Still works. Still works. All right. All right. All right. Take it away. Well, well, hold on. We're going to have a mistake. This building was built in 1971. No. Um, we're good. We're sharing. We're good. All right. Sean Duncan, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, one of the highlights of my year was this year was going to Seattle for DrupalCon and uh, Alex Pott was giving a session on, yes, Drupal 9. Uh, and uh, I know Alex's name. Um, I don't know that I've ever been in the same room with him. Uh, maybe he was at a session that I was at, but I don't actually know Alex. Some of you probably know, do know, know Alex. It was an awesome session. And as often happens at sessions, there was like one line that he sort of just dropped in as, at one point as he was going through some things you need to be mindful about, thinking about Drupal 9. Um, and that was the one, that was my biggest takeaway. And so that's, that's sort of the foreshadowing. That's what I'm going to show you um, uh, today. But I know we've had a talk uh, in some recent meetups about Drupal 9, but uh, I don't know that everybody who's here tonight was here that night. Um, so let me just give like a minute. Um, Drupal 9 is scheduled to be released next year. And 
with the change to Drupal 8, uh, Drupal adopted what I will call, I don't know if Core calls it this, but I would call it symphony style um, development um, in the sense that when we go from eight to nine, the code base for eight, for seven, let's see, 8.9.0, let's say, is the last Drupal 8 release, and 9.0 will be exactly the same, except everything marked deprecated will be dropped. So it's evolutionary development, not revolutionary development. If you've lived through Drupal 6 to 7 or Drupal 7 to 8, where we had to rewrite everything, we don't have to do that to be ready for Drupal 9. We just have to not use the stuff that's marked deprecated. If you're not, if you're not using anything marked deprecated, you're good. So there's an, there's, there's an effort going on right now um, in Drupal 8 to get rid of the things that are marked deprecated in Drupal core. So I'm gonna switch this to presentation mode so people who are in the back can read. Let's see. There, it got bigger. Uh, so this is a deprecation notice um, where uh, deprecated in Drupal 8.0.0. Deprecated in 8.0.0? How could that be? Well, remember, Drupal 8 was in development for five years. So some great idea that came along early in Drupal 8, then a lot of other things started to depend upon it. So we shipped with it. It was deprecated the day we shipped it. Um, but it's going to go, and that's Entity Manager. So I'm reaching back to the, well, I, I don't know, maybe there's something older that was deprecated, but Entity Manager is deprecated. And we don't want to use that. So uh, let's say you, in Drupal 8, you want to extend a core class. We do that a lot. And Drupal 8 also introduced this uh, dependency injection pattern that uh, for a lot of us, our first encounter, this object-oriented pattern was in Drupal 8. And we hadn't done it before. And we didn't really know how to do it, but the core developers clearly knew how to do it. So we went and there was no, when Drupal 8 came out, there was either no documentation or there was bad documentation because it had been in development for five years. So you might find a blog post that was written two years ago and it was right when the person wrote it, you know, no, 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 you know, nothing on them, but now Drupal 8 had changed because it was under development and it's not right today. I remember when Drupal 8 first came out, I would filter my Google results by, I don't want to say anything more than a year old because it's probably wrong. And finally, you just end up going to the code. So here is a core class. This is the entity view controller. And maybe you have some reason that you need to make your own entity view controller for some custom entity and you want to customize it. So this is object oriented programming. You would naturally extend this class and you would say, well, then I want to add something. So your tendency, might, what we all did was we would, we want to inject some new thing and the injection magic is happening in the create method where the create method gets called by a factory and it makes a new one of these things. And when it's called, I, I didn't understand this for a really long time. So if my explanation doesn't make sense, I'm sorry about that too, but the factory calls this create method and return new static means give me a new copy of the thing, the, the object that we're in, give me another one of those. And that causes the constructor to get called. The constructor that you can see above, it wants an entity type manager and a renderer. So we're injecting into it with the container call there in the, in the, in the create method, two services, entity type manager and renderer. And if I wanted to add another service and I was going to extend this, then in my extended class, the thing that we all did, what that I'll show you that I did in my first Drupal 8 site in a moment, was we, we copied this pattern. And it works. It's going to work for, for as long as this runs in Drupal 8, because Core is probably not going to change the constructor class, the, the constructor method. 
But Alex Pott said the constructor is an internal method. Let me say that again. Alex Pott said that the constructor on core objects is considered by the core team an internal method. That means that they make no backwards compatibility promise about it. That means that they're free to change the constructor anytime they want. And so if we use this pattern, our stuff will break. And it's definitely going to break in, from Drupal 8 to Drupal 9 if we do stuff like this. So here is the responsive image formatter class from Drupal 8. Let's look at that. It's a plugin, so it's got this plugin annotation stuff that's really cool. I'm not going to talk about that tonight. Um, but um, here's its constructor. And here's its create method. Look at the, now, if you're using an IDE like PHP, like I am now, you'll see this is getting, this is getting lined out because it's a deprecated method because it's coming from Entity Manager. Remember that first class that we looked at? It's deprecated. So when Core comes along and takes the responsive image formatter and they make it Drupal 9 ready, they're going to change the constructor. They're going to change the things that are being called here so that it's not, it's not being used anymore. So my very first Drupal, publicly released Drupal 8 site is my company's website. And I needed, I don't even remember why I needed to do a thing. I just pulled this up tonight, today to come over. I needed to make an, a special image formatter for some, to solve some problem in that site. So I extended the responsive image formatter from core. Let's get it big again, because we're actually, I'm going to, I'm going to live refactor this tonight. Um, so uh, we've got stuff coming in here. Um, and we've got all of this constructor stuff. I guess the, the uh, entity manager stuff is actually happening in my, in my call new static because I just copied what core was doing. And what, I, what did I need extra? I needed a breakpoint manager service and I needed the image factory for some reason. But I don't want to rebuild the core constructor, especially if, my core, if core's constructor is using a deprecated object because when they change it, my thing's going to break. So Alex Pot said, the thing that stuck in my head was, do all your custom service creation in the create method. And I didn't have my laptop. I just sort of followed that way. I thought, oh, he explained it more eloquently than I have tonight. And I thought, OK, that makes sense. I, I can see how that would work. But I didn't have my code in front of me. So I went back to my desk. Not long after that, I was doing a new extending thing. And I, or I was, maybe I was working on a site where we thought, okay, we should make this method ready for Drupal 9. And I thought, okay, I'll refactor this. So here's my, here's my added variables. So I pulled that out and I brought down here into the create method and I taped it in and PHP Storm immediately said, you can't do that. Now, why is it all squiggly? Oh, yeah. Because the create method is a static method. And I immediately thought, I must have misheard Alex. There's no way that I can, that I can populate a variable, a class variable, inside a static method because I can't get it. I can't use this. So I went into Slack, and there's a Drupal 9 readiness channel. Uh, where people are working on this. And I went in there and I said, hey, Alex. Um, and this is one of the wonderful things about Drupal. Like Alex is like a core committer. Like in lots of software systems, he would be close to God and he wouldn't talk to anybody. And I said, did you say at your session that we should do this thing in the create method? And he, and he slaps me back and says, yeah. And I said, how does that work? It's a static method. How do I, how do I get at, I, I can't do that. He said, yes, you can, because there's something you don't know about PHP. And this is awesome, because I've been writing PHP code for more than 10 years, um, and I'm a technical architect, and I think I know PHP pretty well. But one of the things I want to share this with you tonight was 
there's still more awesomeness in PHP. So here's the thing. This static method is inside the class that it's talking about. And it turns out in PHP, you can access class variables of an instance of the class in a static method if you're in the class. Did that blow your mind to blue mind? So I'm going to show you, and maybe it'll make more sense. So we're in this class right here. And what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to make these container calls. So I'm going to take those out. It's still going to say it's broken, but we'll fix it in a moment. I want my breakpoint manager to go in there. And I want my image factory to go in there like that. With me so far? Those are my two special things. I'm going to get rid of all of this. Because the key thing is, I don't want to know or care about what my parent class is doing in its constructor, because I can't rely on it. Here's the magic. I like to call it instance, because it makes logical sense to me, equals parent create. And I'm going to send it all the things that I'm getting above. So I've got the container. I've got the configuration. I've got the plugin ID. I've got the plugin definition. See, was there anything else up there? Nope, that was it. So the parent, because I'm using, a, I'm extending a class that has this create method that when, so when my create method gets called, there's already another create method upstairs that does all the core stuff, uses all those deprecated classes. And I don't, if I do this, I don't mess with that. Well, it returns the create method. It does new static. It makes a copy of the class that, that we're in. So even if I call the parent create method, PHP static means make a copy of the class that's it's being called from. Let me say that, that sink in. Minute. When you put a static keyword on something and you, so if I call the parent create method and it says new static, because I'm calling it from my copy class, this lifestyle processor, because it has the static keyword, it doesn't make a copy of the parent. It makes a copy of, of my thing. So now I have a copy in instance of my extended class. And I can do this. And all the squiggles go away. This is what the core maintainers expect us to do with dependency injected classes that we're extending, where we want to put extra services in. We're supposed to do it in the create method. We're supposed to do it by calling the parent create and putting that in a variable which now lets me access my own locally created in my descendant class protected uh, parameters and protected variables. I had no idea. Yeah, <laughs> uh, JD's doing the mind blown thing in the back. I had no idea that this was possible in PHP. It is possible. I've now done it multiple times. Um, it doesn't crash when it runs. It really works. And now I'm protected. When they get rid of any, this particular class, I thought when I chose it earlier today, it had Entity Manager in the constructor. It didn't in the, had it in the create. But when they get rid of Entity Manager, if I do it this way, I'm not using any Drupal 9, 8 deprecated code. This will work in Drupal 9. But if I do the other way where I override the constructor, see, now I've, I've done all the constructor stuff. So now I can go up and I can get rid of of all of this, I have no constructor, no constructor at all. I'm, I'm now depending upon the parent constructor. Because I, and that means that, um, look, at all, look at all the things I don't have to have in my use, in my use declaration anymore. If, I, if, I, if you're using any kind of P, uh, Drupal code style uh, 
you know, linter, when you go to try to commit this after you do this, it's going to tell you to get rid of all that stuff because you're not using it anymore. You only put that in there in your extended, in your own subclass because you needed to make the constructor work. But you don't, not only do you not want, do you not care about this stuff, if any of that stuff is, is um, deprecated services, that's going to break too because those are going to go away. So now all I'm left with is the stuff that I'm using. Now, I have a couple of contributed modules. I spent a weekend recently refactoring all of this because when Drupal 8 came out, the only examples we had were Drupal core and they were too busy getting Drupal 8 shipped to really tell us about this. Um, and uh, I think it probably, some of it snuck into core as well. Um, so they're in the process of going through all the extended classes and uh, changing this. And they're also in the process of going through and taking out all the deprecated methods. So by the time we get to next summer, if, we, as mo if you maintain modules and you've done the module maintainer stuff to be ready, going from Drupal 8 to Drupal 9 will just mean changing in your .info file that you will run in 9. That's it. So this is not a deep talk. This is one specific topic of a really wild thing that I had no idea you could do in PHP, but we actually we need to know about if we maintain any custom code to be ready for Drupal 9. That's it. Questions? Yeah. Uh, modules, yes. Is yes. Yeah, okay. But wait, wait, you have to have the microphone so you'll, otherwise you won't get He's on the not tape. waiting. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Ask it again. Okay. Just I didn't get. Okay, this is possible and it's quite advised to do the uh, already in Drupal 8, right? Not only is it possible to do in Drupal 8, it's what we should have been doing in Drupal 8 for the last three years. Okay, but is something that we really need to do that for in for Drupal 9, or we can still start be so on, on this. If you're lucky, there's not there's no reason that that the way we were doing it won't work in general. But constructors are considered internal. So that means that if you're extending a, par a parent class that, that has this constructor create pattern, the core maintainers are free to change the things that happen in the constructor. And therefore th what happens in the parent create anytime they want. The create method is under backwards compatibility um, requirement because it only has a handful of required parameters for a regular class, it's always the, the container. And for a plugin yeah. that's using the container plugin factory interface, it's these extra few parameters, and that's it. And so, and actually, this happens every time that, uh, I mean, our class is not uh, a service. All the plugins, uh, they don't have the, I mean, they do have the create method, right. so we can apply these. Right. The services don't have the create because we injected the the service into the YAML. Yes. The now you'll you'll run into this same thing if you are overriding a core service with a service decorator. Uh, yeah. Jake uh, slacked me about it earlier this week. I didn't have a chance to write it up, but uh, in that process, it's possible to use the the service that you're overriding as an interior service. And you just want to do that in such a way that you are again ignorant of everything that's going on in the in the in the in the parent service. A lot of us also in those instances have extended um, the parent service, and if we're doing it and leaving the the create the constructor alone, then we're fine. But if we're extending it and we're adding our own services, um, then then it's it's better to to just let that happen in the interior and just use that interior service method. But yes, this is ready now. You should do it. We should have always done it. It blows my mind, but it actually works. I think, Jake, do you have a question? Oh, hold on. Yeah, this is great. I need it. I mean, people get really upset when you change um, any of the definitions to like any code that you have. If you change even the order of the services that are coming in, it breaks people who extended the constructor. Right. Is this pattern documented in any blog posts or like named? Um, 
Because that's, I, I mean, you could ask Alex Pot, because I'm not even seeing it in core necessarily. I'm trying to look for some. It, core, core may not be doing it because core owns the constructor. Oh, uh, yeah. So uh, if, if core changes, the, if core changes the services that a class depends on, core is free to change the yeah. constructor. But what they're saying is they have no contract with you. If you extend their service, their class, and override their constructor, mm -hmm. then that's on you. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, with the decorator pattern, like just to emphasize, because I brought that up to you, it's, it's so Symphony supports these decorators that allow you to make minor changes to services without taking full control over it, which is incredibly, you just have to search Symphony service decorators. Yeah, it's cool. And the other pot that's at phase two, I forget, what's his name? It's not Alex Pot, it's like Michael Pot. Mm -hmm. You wrote a blog post right. where it's like canonical where that's it. You look at it and you're like, <clears throat> I got it. Except in that blog post, he expresses the opinion that you should subclass the service. Really? I see. And, and you might be able to get away with that as long as you didn't have to mess around with the constructor and the parent service doesn't have a, de a deprecated service that's coming into mm -hmm. it. Um, yeah. He said the reason to do that, which is makes sense because we're lazy, is that if you code to the services interface, you have to re-declare all of the required methods. Mm -hmm. But if you want code that's not going to break and the parent service uses a, a, a current service that is deprecated, you can do the other thing where when you do the service decorator, you can, in that there's a thing where you can call the parent service as they call it an interior service. Mm -hmm. Redeclaring those required methods are nothing more than just like naming the function yeah. and then passing the work off to the parent. Yeah, I, I worked with someone and I, it was like to fix a dress, uh, how, oh, how the logger system was working to stop like dress from logging every single watchdog request that came through. Right. And you could decorate that because that's like a very simple interface. Right. And it worked out well, but thanks. Yeah, this is great. Absolutely. I had a similar question. Is this, and you may not know the answer, I don't know if anyone's in there, is this pattern unique to PHP because of the fact that PHP will so I don't, use static in that way? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some flavors of C in which it's, because a lot of our syntax is C-like. Yeah. But I don't know. No. It's, yeah. it's, it's not, it's documented Right. It, it works as documented. Yes, but, it, yeah. it's not a hack. If yeah. you go, if you go to the page, because you know I'm nerdy enough to go look. If you go to this PHP Net documentation page for static, um, there's a little line about this. Right. There's like one line on the static documentation page on PHP Net that I've looked up something once before, but I yeah clearly did not have memorized. <laughs> well, shame on you. I know. Yes. All right. And scroll to the left. Yes. Yeah, so again, to to reiterate, the heart of the trick is you you take you call the parent create method and you stick it in a variable, and then you use that variable with your pro protected properties to forget about the container. Yeah. Stick it in there. That's cool. Anyone else? Once, twice. All right, thank you very much, Sean. That was awesome. Minds have been blown today. All right, uh, mind blown. Okay, uh, we're gonna get the the, uh, the the slide up so I can properly introduce our next. Photo. You guys can come up and start start doing what you do. Let me get the uh, Zoom going. So, uh, oh, you're not on Zoom yet. I got it open. Oh, to, to, what? Talk to Chris who's right there with the beard. So I got a, I got a, I got a vamp again. This building was built in 19, so no. Um, that joke is never gonna get old, by the way. Never. Um, yeah. So what's going on? How are people? Where are you from, sir? No, I'm kidding. Um, all right, you on? Yeah. We're good? All right, here we go. Um, so Jim uh, uh, Bardis and, and Jeremy Chase from uh, from somewhere. 
I bet they're going to tell you in just a minute where they're from. They're going to be talking about Drupal on Kubernetes. From New Jersey. They're from Jersey. Fantastic. Everything is legal in New Jersey. No. Um, they're going to talk about Drupal on Kubernetes and, uh, and go through some examples. And it's going to be, uh, it's going to be an awesome time. And well, while Jim is getting this set up, uh, so I'm really just here for uh, refreshments and to help answer questions. Moral support, so, ladies uh, and gentlemen. I'm going to say hi. And uh, we'll sit down. So, All right. Wanna... Jeremy Chase, everybody. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. And, uh, I'm just figuring out how to share the right. That's all good. Hey, there it is. That's right. All right. Look, that's Drupal. Well, that's Kubernetes. Something. You put them together, Drupernetes. Um, and we're good. You can't hit the button to present. It's a... Why can't you hit the present button? It's the Zoom boxes. Are right. oh, the Zoom boxes in the way? There it is. All right. Here we go. Jim, ladies and gentlemen. Woo! Give me one sec. I still. Oh, I was done vamping and everything. All right. Okay. Let's see. If I hit a button, does it move? Nope, not yet. We'll get there. Yes. Ah, it moved. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Jim. Uh, this is just going to be a quick run through Drupal uh, on Kubernetes, just an example. Um, yeah, no, I can't watch my notes and do that. All right, let's just try winging it. Um, so <laughs> I'm Jim Bardis. Uh, you just met Jeremy Chase. He's my co-founder. We are running Lamp.io. Uh, and we have spent the better part of the last year uh, playing and, and wrestling with the Lamp stack on Kubernetes. Uh, and when JD mentioned in the Slack channel uh, a week ago that you guys were still looking for another talk, I thought uh, I could give an example of this. Uh, and uh, he said, yes. So here we are. Um, the bottom here is just a quick logo of the kind of a logo resume of the places we've worked and the websites we help generally be on call for. Um, so what this is about is an example of an installed Kubernetes and, and then a guided tour uh, of the parts and how they connect together. Uh, so you can just get a feel for like the nouns and the, where they land in the whole system. Um, all right, so before we go here, I'm just gonna kick off uh, the install that uh, this talk was supposed to be about a live demo here. Uh, so the, that as you, some of you installed Drupal might know, it takes a bit. Um, so we'll leave that running in the background. Um, what this isn't is necessarily the right way to run Drupal and Kubernetes. Uh, just dozens of technical layers and, and decisions to be made and eventually enough permutations means no two people will agree on how to run this. Um, so I just wanted to disclaim that upfront. <laughs> um, uh, so before I really deep dive, uh, just to get a feel for the audience, who here like manages their own Drupal hosting or, or chooses or is responsible for their own hosting like within the company? Cool, okay. Uh, is anybody using Kubernetes today? All right, I know you. <laughs> okay, um, but probably a lot more of you are familiar with Docker, right? Is anyone using or familiar with Docker? Yeah, right. Okay, so you'll when we get towards the end, you'll sort of see where the Docker containers come in and it puts this all together. Um, so the main question you want to ask before you waste any time thinking about something or, or working on it is uh, why? Why would you involve uh, Kubernetes in your Drupal life? Um, and I think there's a fair number of you in a fairly large demographic where the answer is don't. Um, but if you're of a certain size where you have many environments, right? Like uh, maybe you're running both your old Drupal 8 site or old Drupal 7 site and a new Drupal 8 one. Uh, maybe you're testing on Drupal 9. Maybe you have dev stage and live environments, QA environments. Um, maybe you're trying to deploy arbitrary feature branches. Maybe you're dealing with microservices. Uh, all of that is the sprawl of your code that if you're using something like Kubernetes, um, and it's basically one at this point, uh, you can create a situation where your code sprawl does not directly one-to-one -one map to your infrastructure in your cloud provider sprawl. So your costs don't move at the same angle of inflection as uh, your freedom to experiment with more software. Uh, all right, so to put this in a um, perspective, uh, we'll just do a quick run through from the perspective of the user. Uh, where Kubernetes is in the world and, and how you relate to it. Um, so right off the bat, our user wants to view a page from our CMS, right? Um, and that's all in the cloud, formerly known as the internet. Uh, and in our case, in this example, we're on the Google Cloud platform. Uh, and the reason for that is because you uh, running Kubernetes on the cloud, you basically want to choose a managed service. You don't want to actually be responsible for 100% of Kubernetes yourself. That, crazy amount of work. Um, so we're choosing the Google Kubernetes engine service that Google Cloud provides. Um, in front of that, you still have things like load balancers. So that's going to live outside the Kubernetes cluster. 
Uh, and then behind that, you still have things like uh, in our in this example, it's Google Cloud File Store. Uh, if you were on Amazon, that would be EFS. Uh, if you were still in a data center, that would be a NetApp. Um, so you got your load balancer in the front, you got your application cluster in the middle, and then you got your files or, or really any data store, like that could be MySQL. You can think of it as something that's behind the cluster. Um, so let's zoom in on the cluster, right? That's the main event here. I just wanted to put it in the context of, if you didn't even know what Kubernetes was or where it lives, uh, it handle, its sweet spot is that layer. It can sort of handle all layers and everything, but if you gotta choose a place to get started, this is where to be. Um, so we just zoom in here and figure out, all right, how do we get Drupal into Kubernetes itself? Um, so Kubernetes, people will usually just use the word Kubernetes, but it, you should almost always think of it as a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, Kubernetes is, is a abstraction that turns clusters of servers into a pool that you can think about as one thing so that you are no longer responsible for this, managing this mess of, of N servers. Um, in Kubernetes, the word server isn't used, the word node is used. Uh, so I'll just keep saying node, but you can just think of that as a VM, an EC2 instance, a droplet, whatever, uh, just a running operating system. So the cluster starts with the master node. That's the brain of the control plane that runs everything, okay? Uh, and then you're gonna have nodes where you actually put your code and, and things do work. Um, and for our example here, we're gonna assume this is a production environment and you generally both wanna be able to scale and stay up in the event of trouble. Um, so think of these dotted lines as splitting the Kubernetes cross cluster across three availability zones within your given cloud provider or you know, rows in your data center. Um, so we'd have three masters spread across the three zones. Uh, and this is really where the super under the hood magic of Kubernetes happens to have the three masters coordinate with each other in a way that uh, they keep in sync and they fail over for each other and you don't have to care about it. Um, there's a whole thing uh, where you, you're talking to the master API server and then it's talking to an etcd data store and etcd you can kind of think of like uh, as Redis that does magic clustering well. Um, so those three masters, uh, then you would have, whoop, jump ahead to them, uh, your three worker nodes, right? You need to spread your nodes across at least the three AZs to, uh, again, have that redundancy. Um, so I think of this as the sort of six-pack minimum viable configuration of a production Kubernetes cluster, um, where you've got your two node types across your three AZs. Uh, now that's already gotten a little crowded, right? The nice thing here is the point of adopting a managed Kubernetes service like GKE on Google or like uh, EKS on Amazon um, is they handle uh, everything behind the curtain here for you. Um, so you can kind of just think of that as Google's problem, not yours. Uh, so we'll just get rid of them for now, uh, spread out a little bit. Um, all right, so all of that was prefaced to, we are now at the point where we have a Kubernetes cluster and it's got three worker nodes and we want to figure out like, okay, uh, what do we do with this? And the answer is we run containers, okay? This is where the Docker part came in. So what your Docker container is gonna live in a node in a cluster. Um, to start. Uh, now, of course, Kubernetes has its own words for everything, uh, and they call it actually a pod, uh, and I meant to add a little more to the diagram here, but the difference between a pod and a container is that a pod can actually be multiple containers, but they are bolted together and they travel together. So all of the containers in a pod live on one node, so you can still just think of it as one box. Um, so pod, key Kubernetes terms, right? If I, if I put a noun in the top left, it's usually a Kubernetes, uh, like a command line or, or an object. Um, all right, so our goal is to get Drupal in here though still, right? Uh, so we're gonna use a tool, actually, I skipped a little piece of this. Um, a pod on its own is not dissimilar from if you were to SSH into a machine and start a daemon or start a process, which is to say that it will run and it will stay running until it crashes or falls over or the machine underneath it reboots or goes away, but it has no construct of a, a service or, or um, a life cycle. Uh, so it's gone if your node rotates. Um, and one of the goals of clustering like this is to be able to use things like spot instances or, or you know, preemptible instances for the cheaper compute. Um, so these three nodes are basically constantly cycling on a 24 hour basis. So if you started something as a pod, it's guaranteed to be gone tomorrow. Uh, that's where deployments come in. Uh, deployments is the Kubernetes noun for um, your deployment of your software where you want n number of pods and you expect n number of pods at all times. That's the contract that you make with Kubernetes. It, it says, okay, I'm gonna keep track of that. And if this node goes down and reboots 
and I check and I see that there are now zero, I'm going to react to that and I'm going to go start another one on another node. So that is the, when you define these objects that are basically promises that the masters will then keep, uh, you create a situation where um, you're not responsible for where things land. Uh, you're just saying, stay up, please. Uh -huh. All right. So in our example, though, even though we want to run Drupal, we are not actually running the Drupal container image. And we can talk about why later. Uh, we're running the PHP container image, which is then going to run the Drupal code. Um, so let's dive into that container a little bit. Uh, you guys, have, many of you have worked with containers, so you get the gist of it. It's, it's you know, you take your, your bundle of code and then you can uh, map in things like environmental variables. Um, config maps are an object type in Kubernetes that are basically just a text file. So you can have actually even a set of text files. So your php.ini, your hp.conf, your nginx.conf, uh, anything you want to have runtime customizable, you can do. Uh, and then your volumes are, you know, mount points. Um, so in our example, this var volume is actually going to be an NFS mount back to that file store uh, I mentioned in the first diagram. And that's where the actual Drupal code is going to live here. Uh, all right, so I might have talked too fast. Let's see if this is, uh, all right. Nope, I think I went too fast. We're going to have to give that a sec. Uh, all right, so we're in the cluster. Uh, we have the load balancer in the front our PHP container in the middle that's connected to the file store that has the Drupal code. Um, but what happens when one isn't good enough? Uh, like if, if you were just looking to run one thing, you wouldn't do anywhere near this much work, right? Uh, so this is where the horizontal pod autoscaler comes in, the HPA. Uh, and that's a Kubernetes object that you bolt onto a deployment object where you say any time the average CPU utilization of the uh, containers in this deployment exceed X percent, launch another one and then launch another one and just keep going. Um, so that's how you can start with one, get it working, load it in your browser and then walk away and not necessarily have to care about traffic as much because it can just go. Um, but what happens when we fill the three nodes, right? There wouldn't really be any point in running another instance of your code on one of these other nodes because then they would just be splitting the pool. Um, that's when you get into the node pool autoscaler. Uh, and that's a feature of a managed Kubernetes service. So that's where Google Cloud and uh, Kubernetes sort of come together and talk to each other. And it will launch more nodes to just keep going uh, so that your container can keep growing. So you'll say, all right, I want that fourth container to scale up to. Uh, and it'll say, hold on, I don't have anywhere to put it yet. It'll launch that VM and then it'll move your fourth guy onto it and it'll do the same thing for a fifth one. It's, it's kind of impressive. It really only takes like 40 or 50 seconds. Uh, versus like the normal 10 or 20 seconds to launch a regular container. Um, all right, Lee. Got too much stuff on my screen. Nope. All right. Well, you might want to try. You don't have your laptop, do you? <laughs> um, so by combining the horizontal, uh, you take your pods, you deploy them in deployments. You apply your horizontal pod autoscaling policies to those deployments, and then you apply a node uh, autoscaler to the whole cluster. You've created a situation now where you can deploy an arbitrary number of Drupal instances uh, and an arbitrary number of other things, right? Like if some WordPress or some Laravel snuck in there um, onto your cluster, and then each one of those individually can scale up or down within the cluster. And then if necessary, they can push out and grow the cluster uh, and it'll shrink back down in the end. So you've created a situation where your development teams don't need to think about or uh, provision infrastructure resources. They just add to the pool. And then as traffic comes from, from real users, from bots, whatever it may be, uh, then the pool can grow and shrink as workload occurs. So you've, you've decoupled the software development pipeline from the infrastructure configuration and infrastructure as code workflows. Uh, all right. And then look back at that demo in a minute. Um, all right, I, I deliberately kept that high level and didn't get into the, the console stuff because I didn't want to switch back and forth a lot. Um, but we can show you console examples of anything if anyone has any questions. I deliberately skipped over a lot of stuff because when I found out we're the third talk at the end of the night, I figured you didn't necessarily want me to go in and explain everything in the universe. Um, but yeah, I, I can, you know, at the Nginx ingress and ingress for Kubernetes is basically, it's, it's right there in the name, ingress. It's 
how you connect the Kubernetes cluster to the rest of the cloud and how stuff comes in and then how it decides what to do with that. Um, so the most obvious example is you got to decrypt the TLS uh, and that means reaching out to Let's Encrypt and automatically renewing your certs. Um, uh, yeah, there, there's a construct of jobs, which is basically just a one-off command. And then there's a construct of cron jobs where you just wrap that one-off command with a schedule. And that means your Kubernetes cluster is now a clustered cron scheduler. So you don't have to, like, I know a lot of LAMP stacks and a lot of Drupal stacks have the cron server. Um, you don't have to have that anymore because it's, it's a, a cluster promise made to you by the masters. Uh, I mentioned earlier, we use the PHP image, not the Drupal image itself in, in this example. Uh, that's in our case, just because we're a, or a more generically LAMP focused than necessarily Drupal focused. Um, it's also because uh, if you read on the uh, Drupal uh, Docker image, uh, it's basically entirely debatable. And I imagine you guys have all had these debates a thousand times yourselves of how to do the file system, what things should be mounted where and what things should be read only and what things should be rewrite and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we sort of leave that decision to the user, uh, but you could run other images. Uh, and then we put stuff on NFS because uh, the LAMP stack, I think of it as its original sin, is basically the fact that it treats the file store like uh, a data store and not, not like a read-only source of code, right? Like code and data get mixed and reading and writing occurs. Um, and if you were starting from scratch and doing the dream 12-factor microservice, you wouldn't do that, but most people's environments predate that or, or weren't that hardcore. Um, and then obviously you'd put a memcache or a Redis in here somewhere. Uh, we just kind of didn't want to spend time on that. Okay. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, I can, again, jump into the console and, and show stuff, um, or if you had any or high level stuff. Unmuting. There we go. Just pops into my head. So I can see why you would want to have for sure all the code and everything off on a file service in FS10 for your hosting for a variety of clients. Yeah. But as I'm watching your horizontal and vertical scaling thing, I'm thinking also about if you're if you're building a you know you are, you are self-hosting you are the Drupal client. Mm -hmm. um, so is there a performance? How much of a performance difference is there in Kubernetes between accessing uh, information that's baked into the container? Like if you were doing your deployment of Drupal code as you know make a container right. versus um, and just had your your images and your files in FS10. Yeah. Is that is that over engineering or would that actually make a performance difference if you were more of an application than a hosting company? There's definitely reasons to sort of play at that seam. Um, so the main thing with Kubernetes is it's an orchestrator uh, and it, it coordinates and it starts things up and it stops things down and it checks things. But other than that, it's not necessarily getting in the way of a lot of these things. So the performance would basically be the same as if you were, you know, doing it without Kubernetes. Um, so like a, a simplified example is to pull a uh, like an index.php or you know a random source file off an NFS mount is basically the same thing as pulling uh, an object out of memcache or something. It's a one to three millisecond hop across the network, uh, depending on the network in question. Um, so you know if you had your code written in a way where it touches 10,000 files, then that could really hurt. Um, but if you're you know on the other end of that spectrum, it's a rounding error, right? Like if you're typical. Right. Uh, Drupal page is going to return in 500 milliseconds, then the first 10 milliseconds getting burned checking some file system times isn't going to really matter. Anyone else? Questions, comments, concerns, jokes, poems, haikus? Especially poems, please. <laughs> Sean has another question. So where is Kubernetes in the universe of uh, Docker Compose and uh, does it, you know, which is a tool for orchestrating some Docker containers right. into more of a thing? Um, so that's kind of a little bit of the scene where the Docker ecosystem is sort of growing up from the developer laptop and the Kubernetes ecosystem is sort of growing down from Google's data centers. Uh, and there isn't a clear way to connect those necessarily. Uh, um, so does a node replace the idea of, of, of composing multiple containers into a thing? I, I couldn't give you the straightest possible. Okay. I'm just curious. Yeah. Um, 
Because still tonight, it's a buzzword that I've heard a lot, but I had no idea exactly what it did. So, yeah, like so when you use Docker Compose, um, refresh me on that. But it's it's basically you're, so, you're building so, a couple images and combining deploying them together. Yeah, we use Docker Compose for our local development environment. So I've got a data, I've got a, a Docker container that's MariaDB, and I've got a Docker container yeah. that's Nginx, and I've got a Docker container that's PHP. Um, and they're all just running on your laptop there. Right. Yeah. So you could, okay, you could think of if you... And, and, and so I say, so I don't do, I have abstraction layers for my developers, but you could say Docker Compose up after defining those services in a YAML file. Yeah. A Compose YAML file, and it would bring them all up together. On your laptop. Yeah. On your laptop, right. Hi, I'm not a Docker expert, but the... the Neither am I. The, the concept that you're saying is very similar to uh, what's called a sidecar container in, in Kubernetes. Um, so in, in that situation, you're bringing up essentially one environment, which is you know, your PHP environment plus uh, sidecars, whatever things you need that go along with, with it. So like in, in, in your scenario, uh, you might have uh, Drupal and the database all come up with Docker, Docker Compose. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think one of the main differences is that in, with Docker Compose, you're talking about a single environment and you couldn't replicate it over uh, additional additional things. Uh, so, but the reason I came up here was because I only caught like half of that because I was trying to figure out why our demo broke. Uh, so I'm going to take the blame for this. Uh, uh, sorry, Jim. Uh, basically, when we go to install uh, Drupal via our live demo, uh, one of the things is we kick off, uh, we create a number of Kubernetes resources, which worked. However, uh, this script. There are a number of other things that you can also pass to it, pass into it. Uh, I broke it. So, <laughs> um, but I mean, I mean, since it's here, we can kind of talk through what that actually is. Um, real shame is that no one else here has ever done that. This you is know, just you. It's not the first time and <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. But this is another thing we can, t uh, we can talk to you about with Coop. Uh, this here is what's called a job, and it's uh, similar to uh, an individual uh, cron. Uh, how would you want to call a job? Like when I think of a job, I think of SSH in and run one command and then log out. So well, we've kind of we've made that a feature, so you can run uh, scripts as arguments to an API command that run on uh, our clusters. Uh, so what we're running here is just straight up. If you if you like Google Drupal.org, what's the proper canonical way to install Drupal right now? This is just a copy paste. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but I don't think it's going to finish. Yeah, but unfortunately, the, the yeah. reason I had to kick it off at the beginning is this takes nine minutes because yeah. uh, Drupal comes in around 20,000 files, uh, <laughs> which is where I got that number. <laughs> mentioned yeah. that example earlier. So, yeah, we, we won't be waiting for this out unless there's like 20 more questions. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of which, questions? I'm the master of transitions. All right. All Thank right. you very right. much. All right, thank you very much, guys. Woo! Do you want to run? All right, so we're going to skip it. We're going to skip it. We're going to skip it. Okay, um, the next meetup, we're going to have another one. Um, we typically do our meetups the first Wednesday of the month. This month was a little bit different because of the July 4th holiday, um, but that's when our meetups typically are. And our next meetup is right here in this room on August 7th. Please do not show up until 6.01 p.m. Um, and uh, you do have to RSVP on uh, meetup.com slash Drupal NYC. Uh, please do make sure that you add your actual name as it appears on your ID so that downstairs when they check in, you're all good. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, click. There you go. Call for speakers. Don't forget, we always want speakers. Come talk to one of the organizers. Click. And uh, after party, House of Brews, down the road, 51st Street and 8th Avenue. Uh, a three-minute walk. Follow the dotted blue, the, the blue dots. We've, we've organized those blue dots to appear on the ground in front of you as you go. Um, so just look for the... No, I'm kidding. Um, but yeah, that's it. Thank you very much for coming. Woo! Yay! All right. Thank you, everybody. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here.